lessons from biblical characters. And we've been on Moses the last few weeks, and we're going to continue on with Moses. Last week, uh, Moses was confronting Pharaoh and being led by, or being used by God to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt and now on towards the promised land. And we quickly found out that they didn't take the short route to the promised land, they took the long road. Anybody ever feel like they're on the long road? When it comes to change, transformation, prophecies coming to pass, things that you want to see, yet it seems like you're on that long road, not that short road. So we're going to go deeper into understanding why God takes us on the long road. So tonight's message is up to Exodus, saved for his glory. Changed the title a few times, but I think I got it this time. The Exodus, so we're going in a long study of the book of Exodus. Exodus, what does the word Exodus actually mean? It means take off, get out of here, let's go, let's move on. Getting out of the past, going towards freedom. So yeah, adios, exodus, whatever. <laughs> I'm out of here. If you, if you once listened to non-Christian music like I once did and sometimes still do today, but one of the songs I used to love was Bob Marley. <laughs> Song, sang a song about Exodus. <laughs> Anybody got that tune? Come on. <laughs> Just giving you a hint. In a couple weeks, I'll be singing on Sunday, so maybe I should sing starting tonight. No, just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm going to really sing this time. But anyway, the Exodus saved for his glory. So we were saved. Salvation is not just the end. It's what? The beginning, it's when everything really begins to happen in our life. So, Life Lessons from Moses, Part 3. Let's look at this uh, little scripture here first from Zechariah 13, 9. Now, I love lions. This is one of my, I love this. This is on my computer, actually. Computer save screen. I just love lions and fire. There's just something about lions and fire. But anyway... I will bring the third part through, through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people and they shall say, the Lord is my God. Zechariah thirteen nine. So who here would say that they are now perfect? Their life is perfect. Matter of fact, everything is just perfect. Anybody? So, do you understand? Because we're getting perfected. The perfect one is perfecting us. And that process is just like when you mine gold. Gold is dirty and full of impurities. And for it to have become pure gold, it must go through the refiner's fire. And that is really the... The whole, you know, everything the whole testament was a type of shadow, something for us to understand. And really the process of getting saved and becoming a disciple and getting into our high calling in the Lord is really the Egypt, the wilderness, and the promised land. Egypt is the world, the promised land. I mean, and the wilderness is the process. You know, the promised land is that ultimate high calling in the Lord. Amen. So let's go a little deeper in the word. Okay, running from our past is the first thing we need to understand. Takes us nowhere. Okay, Exodus. Again, we would love to run to those good things, to those great things, to those promises that God has laid up for us. Amen. To that perfection. We love to get perfect as soon as possible, but that does not come that Quickly. And the one thing we have to understand is that you can't run from your past because your past is with you. Your past is with us. How many of you know people who were divorced and thought by in remarrying things would just be better now? When they never dealt with the reasons why they got divorced. Right. They just thought maybe a better person 
better situation. Problem is, same stuff in you is with you when you get into the new relationship. So eventually, things are going to get ugly again. Yeah, the baggage is still with you. Good, we're talking back. Awesome. Amen. So, uh, Bear Bryant, fam famous coach for, I don't know, who was it, the Bears or somebody? Oh, Alabama, college football. Yeah, I know pro uh, better than that than college. I mean, yeah, pro is better than college. It says, in life, you'll have your back up against the wall many times. You might as well get used to it. So God's way of dealing with us is he doesn't just let us run past our problems, our hurts, our issues. He allows them to come back into our face. So we can deal with them, yeah, but really, so we can surrender them to him. So the children of Israel were running away from Pharaoh, hoping Pharaoh would not come back after them. And God could have took them this way, but he took them another way, and that way was didn't make sense way because there was nothing but a sea in front of them and they just probably hope hope no they don't come back to get us well they did <laughs> Pharaoh and his army came after them they said forget this we just lost all our slaves who's going to do the work so he went after them and they freaked out they were full of fear scared, panicking, don't know what to do. Thank God for Moses. He decided to have faith and said, you know what, if God delivered us from all that stuff already, he will deliver us again. And so, by faith, he put out that staff, the sea split in two, children of Israel went across, and when the Egyptians tried to cross, what happened? The sea came over them. Because it was one thing to be delivered from your from the enemy. It's another thing to see your enemy defeated. Right. The children of Israel had to have a shift in mentality. They had to see how God, how big God was. So a lot of times why we go through things is for that exact purpose. For us to realize how great God is. So the the thing that most of us can't stand to do is the word confrontation. Does anybody like confrontation? You do? Stop. <laughs> yeah. She does. There is one person that likes it. There are some people that really love it. I think, Lee, Lee you like confrontation, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Been in it through a few over the years. But confrontation is a must in order to see forgiveness completed. Right. It's easy to say, Lord, I forgive them. It's another thing to face them and say, I forgive you. Amen. So one of the things, one of the main things that God will deal with us initially in our walk in the Lord, now that we're saved, is dealing with unforgiveness. Because as long as there's unforgiveness, there is a wall. And can you walk forward if you're facing a wall? So you're stuck. So as long as there's a wall in front of us, we're stuck exactly where we're at. But God is not wanting to keep us where we're at. He saved us for His glory. Amen. And for His glory to be seen, we can't let walls separate us. So forgiveness, confrontation has to take place. We've got to be willing to confront our enemies. We've got to be willing to confront those we've hurt and those who have hurt us. And those who have hurt us, they might not say, I forgive you, but we have to forgive them. Right. We, got to, we have to give them the opportunity. If we don't ever give them the opportunity, that wall is still up. Now, if we have done everything we can, we can be free. Amen. Amen. Is somebody ever worth, are they worth it? Is whatever pain and hurt they've done to us worth holding on to the rest of our life? No. You know, somebody that we have, might not have encountered since we were little children still might be inside here, still might be in our life, in our home, in our world, because we haven't forgiven them. Right. We haven't been willing to confront them. And some people's hurts and pains, it's understandable, yet 
No excuses with God. God has given us the cross. He has forgiven us our, of our sins. He's given us His forgiveness. And now that we have His forgiveness, we can now give His forgiveness to someone else. I might not feel like I can forgive somebody. Because but faith is not feeling. Faith is choice. And I choose to believe that God has given me His forgiveness so I can offer to others even though what they did to me naturally doesn't deserve forgiveness. Yes, over time, God can change your feelings. Yes, definitely. All right. Next slide. Oh, I went backwards. Sorry. We're not talking about going backwards tonight. We're talking about going forward. Amen. So the most important thing we got to understand when we're facing others, when we're facing confrontation, when we're going into dealing with our past, dealing with sin, dealing with the enemy, is the battle is not ours, our bat the battle is the Lord's. So just like the enemy beat us up when we did not know the Lord, the enemy will continue to beat us up if we don't involve God in the battle that we're facing. The battle is the Lord's. Exodus 14, 31 says, When the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before Him. They put their faith in the Lord and in His servant Moses. So we got, you know, God is, wants to fight our battles. He wants to prove to us that He is our deliverer, that the enemy is under our feet. He wants to show that to us. And the people who have wronged us, if they do not get right, punishment will come upon them. Right. But we got to let the Lord do all that. Let the Lord fight the battles. Let the Lord be judge. So what is this process that we're on? Well, the process, the main battle that we're facing is with our minds. Okay? It's the, it's the way we think. We put the blame upon people. Put the blame on circumstances and situations, but the big problem usually is the way we think. So renewing your mind. What does that mean? Changing the way we see, changing the way we hear, changing what we do, changing what we say, and changing what we think. All that work needs to be done in us. And that is a lot of work. And the the goal of this is to be formed into the image of Jesus Christ. That's what we're saved for. Jesus was, everything he did was for the glory of his Father. It was for his glory to be made known. And that is now our call as sons and daughters of God is to live for the glory of God. So to be formed into the image of Jesus. When we read about Jesus in the Bible and we compare our life to it, do we fall short? We do, but God is still at work in us. And so we need to, when we read about Jesus, we need to read and believe that this is the life that I can live because Jesus, the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that was in Him, lives in me. So in this process of renewing the mind, being formed in the image of Jesus Christ, letting go of all the things that we were once conformed to and now be transformed by His Word, the key to it, as God reveals truth and exposes lies, our ability to surrender those things will determine our advancement. So how do we take steps forward? We take steps forward by surrender. Sometimes in a worldly perspective, it's all about you never surrender, you never give up, you never back down. But actually with Christ, you always surrender. When he reveals his his the, the, the issues of our heart, the pains, the, the unforgiveness, the sins of our life. And so depending on how this takes place in our heart will depend upon the level of faith that we have. Faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by what? The word of God. But how does the word affect our heart? Our life will depend upon really the condition of our heart. So our heart is like a field. And God is now our farmer. And he's trying to work our field and change our heart so that we can get to a certain place. Let's read it. It's all about the parable of the sower. 
You see this behind you, behind me, not behind you. Uh, first of all, you see in the parable of the sower, so there was faith blinders. You know, the first seed that was planted and the birds came and ate up those seeds. That's when our value of God's message is not yet understood and is disregarded. I mean, we don't, our roots are not deep enough, we don't understand enough, and it's, we're quickly misled. We can receive the word, we can walk out, we can talk to our friend on the phone, and just like that, we've turned the other way again. We turn back to the way of the world. It's just not going deep enough. So sometimes that's enough to take people away from the Lord. Next was the rocky ground. Seeds planted, but you have, we have all these all these things in our life. Contentment and surface faith in God skips dedication and depth needed to stand firm. So when our dedication to God, when our relationship with God is basically Sunday morning, Wednesday nights, you know, here a little bit, there a little bit, everywhere a little bit, but not a lot. When our when we're not taking the word in a regular basis, every day, surrounding ourselves with worship, praying to the Lord, coming to church regularly, having a good support team around us, then our faith doesn't grow and it's rocky. And therefore the seed comes and the seed goes. Then there's the faith rebel. So faith blinder, faith rocky, and faith rebel. Faith rebels destructively allows worldly priority and worldly priorities to compete with faith in God as primary. Okay, worldly priorities. This time of year can be all about Christmas, but not about Christ. Right. So therefore, we're busy shopping and going to the mall and going here and going there and going to all these Christmas thingies, but it's not about Jesus, and so we're busy and we're not appreciating what this season's really about, what all our life is really about. That's Jesus. And then the ultimate goal that the Lord has taken us so that we can advance forward is remaining faith. Enduring faith in Jesus fruitfully understands and practices God's Word. So we don't just hear God's Word, we apply God's Word to our life. It's activated, and now that it's activated, it's giving our feet forward motion. We're moving, we're going somewhere. We're going forward. So with the children of Israel, now that they cross the the Red Sea, the first thing they did, of course, was celebrate. It was a time of celebration. They witnessed the impossible become possible. So they celebrated, they praised God, they sang God. How many of you have had these real high moments in the Lord and then followed up by real low moments right away? Amen. It often happens that times. I've gone to many like power, have many a powerful experiences with the Lord. You know, gone to a great mission trip or great uh, conference or retreat or something. Really heard from the Lord, got nearer to the Lord, and I come back and the test is right there. Right. And so the children of Israel, there they are. They're celebrating. God takes them on the journey. They think it's going to be just a continual celebration party all the way through, and they go to a place called Mara. Now Mara means bitter. Bitter waters. So right away they were tested. Because God is not, was not done with them yet. They had left Egypt, but Egypt was still in them. Right. And we've left the world, but the world is still in us. So God's reason for keeping us here on earth is to deliver us from this world completely inside and out. So here they go to the place called Mara, which means bitter and as you see, after that, they're going to go to a place called the wilderness of sin. It's pretty easy to understand. That we, you know, it doesn't take a lot of Hebrew understanding to get the definition of sin. Sin is sin. <laughs> so, so here we go with bitterness. Bitterness imprisons life. It imprisons us. Love releases it. Bitterness paralyzes life. Love empowers it. Bitterness sours life. Love sweetens it. Bitterness sickens life. Love heals it. Bitterness blinds life. Love anoints its eyes. 
by Harry Emerson Fosdick. So bitterness, bitterness is a big issue. And that's why we're bitter. Why do we, you know, how do you know if you're bitter? Very easily. You're bitter if you're easily angered. As long as we can be easily moved in our emotions in a negative way, we have bitterness, unresolved issues in our heart. Now, wouldn't it be easy if Christianity was all about just loving God? Amen. That was it? Amen. Loving God did not mean loving people. We just love God. We don't have to connect with His church, with the body. We just come here, worship the Lord, and go home. So, I've got nothing against God. It's His fan club I can't stand. <laughs> So Christianity would be a lot easier if we didn't have to deal with one another. Amen. We just isolate ourselves. You know, maybe it is easier to be like a monk. Just go up into a cave. I was just actually reading, I'm taking a course on, on religion. And it's from a non-Christian perspective, but the, the chapter on Christianity I'm reading right now, a reading by Thomas Burton on contemplation. And he was a Catholic monk, but the amazing understanding that he gained and in this kind of monk, you don't talk to anybody. Your life is just contemplating right. and writing. But what he wrote was just phenomenal, so powerful. But wouldn't it be nice just sometimes to do everything? Pretty boring. No. But being in a cave and just... Amen. <laughs> shave the head. Don't have to even think about taking care of my hair. It's just get up and pray all day and night. Don't have to deal with nobody. Anyway. I wonder, they still had to eat. I wonder if one of the monks or somebody had to cook. I wonder if they were satisfied with the food. Probably at some time got upset. Anyway. Anyway, loving God is all about loving people, but God doesn't send you problems you can't face or people you can't handle. But understand that whoever is sent into our life, God allowed it. And whatever, I used to tell the youth, of, especially youth back in Jules' day, they sometimes they get a little ugly. And, uh, I always tell them that, you know, they get ugly because of one of the other youth. And I say, whatever, whoever is making you ugly, it's because of the ugly that's already in you. That's right. That's right. Some people like you probably don't like to hear that one. <laughs> but it's the truth. Why are we moved by whoever? What really is the deal? God doesn't send us things that we can't handle because he knows he's with us. And through him, we can handle anything if we have faith. So there's going to be a continual, this is the main test that we're going to be on all the days of our life on earth. I prayed this some years ago, and I've used this example many times because I'm still on this test, and it's called the love test. So when you ask God, Lord, help me love others better. Help me use your love to love others. He will send everyone in your path that is difficult to love. So make sure he brings all your family into your world and everybody else and friends. They're always there, always around because you got to pass the love test. It's all about the love test. So some of you probably right now are experiencing the love test. Amen. And it's not about figuring out who you're going to marry or who you're going to date or whatever. It's about learning how to love people. All people. So loving God, how do we love God? We love God by loving people. So that is the thing that we probably don't want to hear, but it's the truth. God created people in His own image. They're the most precious creation that He created. And so the greatest way to love Him is to love others. And so that will be our journey until we can get that right. We're stuck where we're at. Now, of course, we can't love people without God's love. 
But the reason why we come to church and get into worship and get filled up is so that we can take that love that we're filled with and give it out to other people. I've had amazing worship experiences with God, encountering His presence, feeling so good. And I leave church and something ticks, somebody ticks me off and snap. Where did all that love go? Goes away just like that. So that is a big part of bitterness. As long as we have bitterness inside of us, there's hurt and pain in us that keep God's love from filling our life. And that's why it's so difficult to love people. As long as we have difficulty loving people, we know we have something, a root of something in our life that needs to be uprooted. God, the great gardener, is waiting to uproot. But this is a two-way street. He's not cleaning our house alone. He will clean our house, our life, but we have to be willing, the willing vessels that surrender, because He gave us a free will. So He won't just change us unless we give Him what to change. So we have to say, yes, this room is dirty, God, and I allow you to clean this room. Amen. To clean my heart. So that is the key to getting past Mara, which means bitterness. Getting past that, made that love test, that area, why can't we love people like God loves us? Because this is what really stands us apart. And I'm studying all the religions, and a lot of the religions have a lot of great wisdom and all that and this and that, but one thing that stands out different from all other things is the love of God. And what other religion has the love of God? No one. People try to have some type of love, but God is love. And real unconditional love can only be given through Him, through our relationship with Him. And so that's what stands us out of the world. So God saved us for His glory. But for His glory to be seen, it's seen by our love that we share with one another. But if we have bitterness, we have all these weeds inside of us, God cannot be seen. So this time, uh, this process area is all about the weeds being pulled out. When the weeds get pulled out, the seeds now can come in. They can go deep inside and all of a sudden something can come out of us. The vine. And then the fruit. The character of God. Amen. Amen. So after Mara, the children of Israel now got to the wilderness of sin. Is that where the word sin came from? I don't know. But we always have a choice. Now, sin, temptation. We can choose sin, but there's always in Christ a way of escape. As 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So God has always gives us a way of escape. We have no excuses why we're tempted. We can have all kind of blaming people and blaming this and blaming that, but as long as we commit the sin, there is no excuse because God has always given us a way of escape. And the more we grow in the Word, the easier it is to escape because the more the Word is alive in us, the louder the Word speaks. The more we feed on the Word and listen to the Word and, 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 and dig deep into the Word, the more the Word of God will speak and expose the lie and the easier it should be to resist the enemy. But of course, we still fail. But thank God for His mercy. But I want to believe that I will reach like Enoch reached place of perfection where I'm just taken up. Why not shoot for the highest that we can shoot in Christ? Amen? Let's not just keep saying, oh, I'm a dirty old sinner. I can't help it. It's just how I am. How I am. I was born in sin. That's what I do. I'm a sinner. No, I was born again. And I have received the Spirit of the living God. And that same Spirit that allowed Jesus, a human being, to live without sin is the same Spirit that is in me. 
So even though I'm tempted, just like Jesus was tempted in all ways, I always have a way of escape because the Holy Spirit is speaking to me and leading me away from sin. Amen. Amen. So our heart should be, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Psalms 51.10. So that's what God is doing. He's removing the sin, cleaning our heart out. So that we can have a right spirit within us. We don't want to have any other spirits competing against God. Because who can, can a man walk with God and with mammon? We can only walk with God. The spirit of God. So we got to let the spirit of God drive out all those snakes inside of us. So my life, this is, and this is, this is the problem that we may have because we have this issue in that we sometimes don't see our own faults. That's right. But there's a lot of fault finders out there, isn't there? Amen. Because Steve's going to go into that a little bit on Sunday. Sometimes our best friends are fault finders. Sometimes our closest family members are fault finders. But sometimes it's necessary that somebody point out our faults. And we need people in our life that are being, that are willing to say it in our face. Amen. Be honest. Yeah, we might as well be real instead of talking about somebody to everybody but the person. Just face the person. Say, "This is what I see." Now it's very difficult to receive that from somebody you're not very close to, but we should have people in our life that we're close enough that they can see into our heart and reveal things to us. So this is sometimes our attitude, my life, my choices, my mistakes, my lessons, none of your business. Get out of your, get out of my business is our attitude. Some people don't get very involved in church. Why? They don't want nobody in their business. Right. Right. Some people don't have any friends. They don't want nobody in their business. We need people in our business. But mainly we need God in our business. Hallelujah. Now God though works through his body because sometimes we can't hear God because we're blinded to our own issues, our own pain, our own problems. We're blinded to it, so we need God's body. But we have to understand that when we gave our life to Jesus Christ, we gave our life to Jesus Christ. It's not our own. So we gave, we gave God the keys. He can open the door and come in whenever he wants. And he can go up and search in and out of our house. And whatever he doesn't like, he can tell us. And he can change it. Because we gave him the right. So we can't take the keys back. we got to let him have his way. And if he wants to use somebody to point out certain things, we can't get offended. Because it's necessary. We should come to a place, I think I mentioned this last week, true strength is, strength in God is when nobody else can move us but God. Amen. So bring it on. You see something in me, tell me. I kind of like it sometimes. I don't know, I like, getting, I like hearing messages that I feel beat up when I get done. Seems like the Spirit of God always goes straight, like a sword, you know, cuts you open. I, I sometimes like that because I really want God to change me. Hallelujah. So here we go. We see the children of Israel in sin. Now what was going on there in this wilderness of sin is that they began to realize that they are missing some stuff back in Egypt. There's a lot of sacrifice on this Christian walk. There's things that they had in the world that they used to enjoy. The main thing that they're thinking about is food. And that's one of our biggest things. Sometimes the temporary pleasure of something, that's the thing that messes up the, us the most. And all they can think about was their bellies. Forget the promised land. Forget where God's taken us. We're going to go back to slavery just so we can have some steak. So we miss sometimes those things in the world when we're looking back. Can't go forward as long as we're looking backwards. And so God revealed Himself with their all their complaining. See, as long as there's as if there's complaining coming out of our mouth, there is wrong in our heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
the book of Psalms continually says what, we should, what should come out of our mouth. Praise should come out continually. What does continually mean? All the time. So if we have negativity and complaining and murmuring coming out of our mouth, there's a lack of trust. Again, that goes back to the bitterness. Because we have unforgiveness in our heart, we distrust people. Because we distrust people, we can't trust God. Because we can't fully trust God, His love can't completely come in. And therefore, we have a lot to complain about. So the children of Israel are complaining and complaining, murmuring and murmuring. So God says, let me show you again how great I am. Even though you don't have steak and even though you don't see food, I will rain down food from the sky. And manna came down and they were able to eat. And as we're going to see later on, they got tired of manna though. Yep, one of the meat. But Jesus' example is my food. This is the, this is where God trying to take us to. This is why sometimes we don't have enough. Sometimes we don't have what we think we should have in the bank in our wallet. We don't have the job that we would like. We don't have maybe the family we would like. We don't have things that we don't like. Why? Because Jesus, God is trying to take us to a place where Jesus came into that He said my food is to do the will of Him who sent me. And to finish the work, do you not say four months and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look on the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Jesus' food was to do the will of the Father. The will of the Father was the harvest. When our life is all about the harvest, saving souls, discipling nations, the Great Commission. When we live our life for the Great Commission, the will of the Father, we will be always satisfied. Because we're seeking first His kingdom. Because the Bible promises that if we seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, then what? All things. Everything we need will be now added unto us. Because we're all about... There is, when you're really following the Lord's footsteps, when you're walking with God and in His perfect will, there is no greater peace. As long as there's a lack of peace in our life, it's because of that right there. Not in His perfect will. Something in our life we're refusing to obey Him in. Because to love God is to what? Obey His commandments. The way people treat you, this is a hard saying, I just threw this in there. I don't know if it was in the right spot, but anyway. The way people treat you is a statement about who they are as a human being. It's not a statement about you. Okay, I remember now. See, Moses, he was the one getting everybody's complaints, getting everybody's murmurs. Have you ever been a parent or a leader or something where everybody's complaining about you? You're the one at fault. You're the one that's not doing enough, not giving enough, not providing enough or whatever. Moses was getting all the heat. God had to remind him, they're not complaining about you, Moses, they're complaining about me. Right. When people complain, really the dissatisfaction that they have is they're missing God and where He's supposed to be in their life. So don't take it personal. we got to not take it personal because people will beat us up, but they really don't know who they're beating up. They really don't know what they're after because God is the source. And if God... They allowed fully in their life, they would be fully satisfied and would have nothing to complain about. Amen? You guys are doing really good tonight. Amen. <laughs> and this is the last slide here. There's a long way still left on the journey, so we've only gone from Mara to Sin. And we're going to continue on the journey in a few weeks. Next week will be Christmas. Pastor Steve will be singing Christmas carols again. And there won't be a lesson, but there will be a lesson the following week on New Year's Day. So we will have church New Year's Day and Christmas. And New Year's Day I will teach because Christmas, New Year's Eve is really when, you know, more of the holiday. Anyway, to avoid stumbling or losing your place, don't look back. You can't change the past, but thank God you can learn from it and leave it behind. The past is the past. There's nothing else we can do about it anymore. But when we surrender to God, He teaches us. 
and reveals to us something that we can learn from it. We can discover God in a new way. We can really discover God as our healer, God as our deliverer, God as our provider. There's so many aspects of God and the only way we can understand who He really is is by going through certain things. And it's not that God put these things in our life for, them, for us to experience it, but it was necessary because that is the world we live in. It's fallen because of the way it is. God will still use everything for the greater good. So Hebrews 12, 1 says, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Hebrews 12, 1. So as we continue in worship, I don't want us to just lift up our hearts before the Lord. Let, him, let us ask the Lord, is there anything that you would reveal to us tonight that we need to lay aside? That, that's what the altar is all about. Of course, you can do it right there in your seat, but there's something about stepping in faith forward that does a greater work in our hearts. So by taking a step forward and laying down things here at the altar, I believe God will do a great work in your heart and your life. Amen. I'll be up here, Lee, anyone else um, to pray with you. And uh, let's, just, let's just pray and then go right into worship as the team comes forward. Amen. Father, we just thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for your work in our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for saving us, taking us out of this world, delivering us from this world, Lord. And now, Lord, we thank you for the process that's being taken place for this world to be driven out of within us so that we can be completely free. Lord, we desire to experience your fullness, freedom, completely filled with your love, O oh Lord. So Lord, whatever is holding us back, reveal to us tonight, Lord. And Lord, as you give us the strength through your mercy to surrender these things to, to you, Lord, we pray, God, that we would leave this place tonight deeper, with a deeper walk, a closer connection to you. And we just surrender ourselves to you right now in Jesus' name. Amen.